Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. How would you describe yourself spiritually? Would you say that you have a high degree of interest in spiritual matters, spiritual issues? Are you someone who is passionate about the things of God? If you are, you are going to be someone who shows a commitment to truth. But what about one who is indifferent, uninterested in spiritual things? Such a person God is speaking to in this chapter of Isaiah. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 29. Now, if we were to describe the people of Israel at this moment in the message that Isaiah has for the people in his day, it would be a message against spiritual indifference, being uninterested and unwilling to encounter the truth of God. Why? Because they do not want to change. So let's begin Isaiah 29 and verse 1. Notice what he says. He writes, Hoy, Ariel. Now, Hoy is a Hebrew word that says, in its current condition, it is heading for disaster. That God's judgment is upon the horizon. And if there's no change, and what change are we speaking about? repentance if there is no repentance if people do not turn once more to god then the outcome the results the future is going to be one of utter disaster and we have to ask ourselves daily does that describe me am i passionate am i committed am i doing the things that relate to god's will Am I under and recognizing God's authority in my life? Am I studying and applying the truth of God to my situations? Using his word as the source of discernment for every aspect, every nuance of my life, I bring it under the the will and the truth of God. If that doesn't describe you, if you are spiritually indifferent, then Isaiah has a lot of words to share with you in this chapter. So we begin with the phrase, woe, Ariel. Now, Ariel, most scholars see this referring to a a nickname, so to speak, for Jerusalem. But the rabbinical scholars, Ariel, from a tradition of Judaism, speaks about the altar at the temple of God. That God is looking at the altar and specifically what is done there. The offerings, the sacrifices that are made. And looking at the hearts of those who bring them, those who work there and what in fact is offered up to him. And this is how God responds. Not by, as we'll see, simply what the people say, but what their worship, what their offering, what their sacrifices say about them and their understanding, their commitment, their interest in God. And in this chapter, These things do not speak well for the people of Israel. So he says, 
Woe to Ariel. Ariel, and then it has a phrase, the, the city that David uh, camped in. And this is simply a synonym for David dwelling there. So we know we're speaking about Jerusalem. We know we're speaking about the place where David established the kingdom. And in other words, the fact that David is used here, that name speaks about a passage that has kingdom implications. And it begins not in a good way. That phrase, woe, as we've learned, how awful the future is going to be if there's not a change. Look at the second half of verse 1. We read, they add year unto year. And what that is saying to us is, year comes, year goes, but there's not any change in the people. They're not growing, they're not maturing, they're not growing in their, their knowledge of God. Their life does not reflect the passage of time. So again, we need to make this personal to each of us. As I grow older, as the years pass by, is there spiritual change in my life? Am I growing in my understanding of spiritual truth? Am I maturing in behavior? Am I becoming more useful, more committed, more effective in serving God? Here, there is no change. And then it ends by the statement, Chagim Yin Kofu. Chagim is a word for festivals. But here again, the rabbinical commentators, because of the name Ariel, which they interpret relating to the altar. And now the Chagim relating to the festival sacrifices, not just the festivals themselves, but the sacrifices that are made. And this word, literally, according to commentators like Rashi and others, it speaks about the festivals being cut off being brought to an end, not continuing. And we know something. We know from what the prophets teach that, that many of the festivals, they were not observed during the time of the kings. We remember that Isaiah prophesied during the time of several kings of Judah. And the worship the sacrifices, the work, the function of the temple, going up to Jerusalem for the festivals, all these things were, were being set aside. The people were embracing idolatry, not spiritual truth. So in one sense, things are being brought to an end. Things are not continuing as God would have them to do. And therefore, what is God going to do? What is his response? Look now to verse 2. It's a word of distress. So he says, I will distress Ariel. I'm going to bring about suffering. I'm going to bring about pain, discomfort. Why? Because he's teaching a spiritual principle. A spiritual law when you are spiritually indifferent that indifference that lack of commitment that uninterest in the truth of God is going to bring about it's a spiritual law no different that if you jump off a a, a ladder you're going to fall these are laws they happen because of the condition we're in nature. When the same way that there are natural laws like gravity, there are also spiritual laws. And this is what he's going to share with us primarily in this first half of chapter 29. That there's spiritual laws and because of how the people of God, his so-called covenant people, 
their indifference, their lack of interest in the truth of God, their unwillingness to, to behave in a way that shows a proper commitment to God. All of this is going to bring about a disastrous outcome. They are going to encounter the punishment of God. They are going to begin to suffer experience pain both emotionally, physically, and spiritually. The enemy, when we are spiritually indifferent, we are empowering the enemy. So God says, I will bring distress to Ariel. And there shall be, and we have two words for mourning, that there will be utterly a, a feeling of grief and sorrow that comes about because of death. So when we are spiritually indifferent, we are inviting death, not just spiritual death, but physical death. These spiritual laws, they just don't have spiritual implications, but implications in regard to every aspect of our being. So being dead spiritually will bring about physical death. Things will begin to die. So he says in the second half of verse 2, and there shall be utterly mourning, and it shall be to me as Ariel, meaning this. Ariel is a word that describes the worship that took place specifically, primarily, at the altar. And the people, they were not acting in obedience. And therefore, because of their disobedience, because of their unwillingness to serve God, God was displeased by that. And therefore, he says, as I am being displeased with you, you are going to experience displeasure. He is going to bring upon them the feelings he has for his people. They are going to know them by God's judgment, God's response to them. Verse 3, and I will encamp, and the word here probably means on, on the side, meaning that God is going to, to do something. He's going to box the people in. There's not going to be, in other words, an easy escape. You're not going to avoid this. What God is saying is going to take place. And think of it this way. There are spiritual laws, and the violators of these laws are not going to escape their consequences. That's what he's saying. God is going to encamp. He's going to be present in every location. And he says, I will set siege against you. And the next word is basically building first. Some Bibles will say a tower, but it's probably better for that which is established. And this is a, a siege mound. So he's going to begin to lay the foundation for the city to be laid siege against. Now, why is this important? Because this is what the people would dread. Having the city being set a siege against her, it brings about distress that is slow in coming, and it simply gets worse and worse, and there's really no outcome other than to go out and fight. And the reason why they didn't go out and fight and the siege wall was laid was because they understood that they were inferior, that the enemy's armies were stronger than them. They were going alone. They did not have God's blessing. So he writes here in verse, verse 3, I am going to, to encamp basically on every side against you. And I will lay siege against you. And then he speaks about this, this siege mound being, being set. And I will raise up against you 
a siege. So the people are going to experience a long, a painful, and a fearful experience from God. Why? This is what spiritual indifference brings about. This is when we are careless with the things of God. Again, the whole passage that we're going to be looking at speaks about Israel and what they're offering up to God, their worship unto him. And they're casual. They are ir irregular with it. They are, are sometimes missing out entirely. They're not interested in worship. And therefore, they're going to experience the, the outcome of such casualness in regard to the worship of God. Verse 4, he says here, you will be made low. Now, this is a word for, for bringing and causing one to be humiliated publicly. God is going to show visibly, publicly, his displeasure with the people. They are going to be spiritually humiliated, and it's going to have physical implications. And it says, I, you will be brought down uh, to the ground, and from the ground you're going to speak. And from the deaths you are going to be made low your words. So he says, you're going to be put down very low. And this is where you're going to speak from. He's going to knock them down from their self-exalted positions. And many here interpret this to mean that they have exalted themselves financially. That they are enjoying prosperity. And this prosperity has turned them away from the spiritual. They are focused on the physical, what their wealth can, can bring to them. So God is going to bring them low. Being low speaks of humility as we spoke of, but also, it also speaks of emptiness. So they are going to be crying out to him from a position of being humiliated. And then he says, and it shall come about as, and this next word, the, the Hebrew word ov speaks about one who is a, an enchanter, a sorcerer, one who is perhaps a better way to translate it is a medium. And this is one that consults the dead. Now, right there, we should see something. Why would we want to have contact with those that are dead? They have, have ceased. They are, are down low. And the point is, Israel's going to be like a, a medium's voice that comes up from the lower parts of the earth. This is how far he's going to bring them down. And the word here speaks about their spiritual condition of, of consulting mediums and enchanters and sorcerers rather than the two prophets. So it says, and it shall come about as a medium from the earth, your voice, from the, the dust, your words will, will chirp. And this is like the chirping. The word here actually speaks of the sound that birds make. And the point here is that it's not discernible. You hear a bird, and he seems to be saying the same thing, no matter what the situation is, what day of the week, what time of the year, they have their own song. And in the same way, God is saying, what you're going to be speaking to me, not going to desert it. It's not going to, to in any way, in the same way that, that birds chip, chirping away every day doesn't cause us to behave differently. We don't hear that and understand it and respond differently. God is not going to respond to, to us. Our, our cries are going to be simply as the chirping of 
a bird. Verse 5. And it shall come about as fine or thin dust. And what's going to be that? The multitude of your foreigners. Now, what this is laying the foundation for is the enemy, foreign enemy, coming and being brought against the children of Judah specifically. And also, we, we can see this in regard to the covenant people in a broader sense. Those who say, I know God, I'm his servants, but in reality, they're not living that way. So God is saying, as the fine dust of the ground, meaning it's many, there's lots of, of fine dust. It's small. Therefore, when you see dust, it's a lot. And he's saying that the enemy, your foreign enemy, is going to be a multitude. And in the same way that the, the chaff passes by, the wind draws it. And when someone is threshing, it just continues one chaff after another after another. And this is what he's saying here. The enemy is going to come and pass through again and again and again. And there will be a great multitude will be those who are tyrants against you. And he says, this shall be suddenly. And he uses two different words that mean basically the same thing. One coming suddenly and one coming without any type of, of indication. So it will happen quickly, and it will happen without any type of indication. So the people are going to be going along what they think are fine, things are good. We have financial stability, there's prosperity, there's happiness, and then suddenly, without any type of indication other than this prophetic uh, revelation, the people are going to find themselves experiencing the army coming again and again and again, bringing instability. Instability will destroy the prosperity and the people will find themselves in great need. Verse 6. Now, how is this coming? Why is it happening? Well, notice the source. Verse 6. It is from the Lord of hosts. And he says, you will be visited, and this word for being visited in this context is that you will be punished. And this punishment's going to come in a very visible, a very discernible manner. He says, like the, the thunder, like an earthquake, like the great sound of a storm or a hurricane, and it's going to be like flames of fire that devour. So when fire is going through, you can hear the destruction, the fire consuming. So God is using here rich language in order to tell them how serious, how devastating the, the outcome of spiritual indifference is going to be for the people. Verse, verse 7. And it shall come about as a dream, as a night vision, a multitude of all the nations, and it's nations that have armies that are warring nations, will be upon Ariel. And all of her, her armies and her stronghold, her fortresses, what does it say here? That there's going to be distress to her. So her armies, her fortresses, they're all going to experience distress. This same word for pain, suffering, turmoil. It's a word of, of displeasure. This is what spiritual indifference brings. Now that shouldn't surprise us because when we are committed to the things of God, when we serve him faithfully, what's the outcome of being a faithful servant? Joy, gladness. 
But when we are spiritually indifferent, we will find ourselves experiencing sadness, sorrow, grief. That's the message of this this text, verse 8. And it shall come about just as the one who is hungry dreams. And behold, one who goes to bed and he's so hungry. You know what he'll dream about? He'll dream about food. And this is what it's saying here. Because of this intense need, the people are going to be uh, be dreaming about this, this provision, that which brings a change. They're going to be dreaming about something very different than their reality. And it's all a dream. Look again at verse 8. For it shall be just as the one who is hungry dreams, and behold, he eats in the dream. But then he wakes up, and there's emptiness to himself. Just as the thirsty one dreams, and behold, he drinks. But he wakes up, and behold, and the word here is ayef. Now, there's a difference between modern Hebrew and biblical Hebrew. There's a strong correlation, but there's differences. And this word in modern Hebrew, ayef, means to be tired, exhausted. Sometimes it's just a word that says, I'm tired and I want to rest. I want to lay down. I want to go to bed at night. But this word in the Bible oftentimes relates to one who is dying, one who is perishing. Now, in modern Hebrew, we use the word goses for that. But in the biblical language, we have here the word if. So behold, this one is, is dying and his soul is, is full of sorrow, of affliction, of distress. Thus there will be this multitude of all the nations, and these are warring nations, army nations, upon Har Sion, Mount Zion. What we find is this, spiritual indifference brings attack against the kingdom of God. Meaning this, we need to understand it in two ways. One of which is this, the kingdom of God is not going to be established in the midst of spiritual indifference. Just that simple. God is not going to move to fulfill promises and Harsion, the the mountain of Zion, relates to the location of where the promises, the excellency of God uh, dwells, where it's available. So he's saying this type of behavior brings war against the promises of God. It pushes them far away. So it's an attack against kingdom things. When you are spiritually indifferent, you're not going to have a kingdom character. You will not be kingdom-minded, and you will not be be receiving the blessings of the kingdom. Verse 9. Verse 9 speaks in clearer terms about the spiritual condition of the people. He says in verse 9, Some of the modern translation has a pause, but it's a waiting. Now, this word in rabbinical language speaks oftentimes about waiting with expectation for for Messiah, for him to fulfill the promises of God. And it's used here because the next word, when we see this waiting And then it's a word for being a mace. So people are waiting for a future, a good future, a kingdom future, but they're going to be amazed because that is not what they're going to experience. God is going to behave very differently. Let me give you an example. I watch frequently here in Israel a rabbinical network. And what you hear, by and large, the the leading voices, the most public voices for for Judaism, 
some of the leading rabbis here, is that things are going to get good. And not just good, but great. They're telling people that all the sorrows, for example, Jacob's trouble, this has been canceled out. All these prophecies in regard to the last days of, of distress and sorrow and wars and stuff, all of this, they say, have been canceled out. And we, in just a moment, that same type of, of thought of suddenly, without any type of indication, goodness is coming. Messiah is going to manifest himself and bring to us the promises of God, the good things. Well, this is not at all what is the reality. The future reality is that people are waiting for that, expecting that, but unfortunately they're going to be amazed, and maybe a better way to translate this is that they are going to be shocked with the reality. And then the next word is you have two primary ways that, that the rabbinical scholars understand this. One would be blinded. They are utterly blinded. That word appears twice. So when the same word appears back to back in a unique construction, they work together, we would translate it in English, being utterly blinded. But, but others point out that it's not a word for, for necessarily being blinded. There's other indications where it has to do with screaming out, crying out. So we could translate it this way. The people are going to, to be waiting, waiting with an expectation, but that expectation is not going to be fulfilled. They are going to be shocked at the reality, and they are going to be crying out, screaming out. And the other interpretation is that they were blinded to the things. Then we read, they were drunk, but not drunk with wine. They, they staggered, meaning they moved, they, they were wobbling in, in weakness back and forth, but not to or because of strong drink. So they were not staggering and confused and, and wandering back and forth and weebling around because they were drunk. That wasn't the influence that put them in this position. What was it? They were following incorrect prophecy. They had been deceived. They were following improper leadership. Their lives did not reflect the truth of God, but they were indifferent to the things of God. But they were passionate about the things of this world. So he says, look at verse 10. For I will pour upon them, and who is this? The Lord. So the Lord will pour upon them. Literally, it's upon you. Isaiah is speaking to the people. The Lord will pour upon you a spirit, and this is a spirit of, of slumber. Now, the word here can speak of a, a trance, but it can also speak of, for example, one who's about to have surgery. They, they receive anesthesia in order to, to put them to sleep. So it's a, a false sleep. It's not a sleep, a normal one, but it's a spiritual sleep, meaning this. When you're asleep, you don't know what's going on. And that's what he's saying. They had been in a trance based upon wealth, based upon prosperity. They are, are confused. And that's really what it's speaking about, being utterly confused and not knowing how to respond because these things have blinded you. These things have caused you to become dull for the things of God. And then he says that he will close your eyes. You won't have any type of perception or revelation with the prophets. He's against these false prophets and the heads of the the seers, these are the ones who supposedly have visions, and they were supposed to be true visions, 
But God says, Kisa, which is he's going to cover up their heads. And this is an idiom which means these seers, as well as the prophets, they're going to have no revelation. There's not going to be anything from God given to the prophets or the seers. Everything's going to be silent from him. There's not going to be any instruction. Why? Because it's a time of punishment. It's a time of judgment. Verse 11. And the vision of everything that will be to you, it will be like words of a book that are sealed. So God, anything that's spiritual, is going to be like words of a book that are sealed, which are given to one who knows the book, meaning knows how to read, saying, read, please, this. And he says, I will not or I'm unable because it is sealed. So he's not wanting to because it's sealed. Well, what do you do? You open it up. You break the seal. Now, this is talking about not like in the book of Revelation, that book that was sealed that no one was worthy. This is a normal way. It's a new book. Open it up. There's a new message that God has for the people. And the fact that he says, I'm not able to because it's sealed. The context says he's uninterested. He's unwilling. He's not willing to do the normal, which is to break the seal. You would do that if you're interested in what's in the book. Look now to verse 12. And the book is given to one who does not know. And the implication is the book, how to read, saying, Read, please, this. And he says, I do not know how to read. Now, there's always what? There's always an excuse. Now, in this situation, the people are being likened to those who are indifferent, who are uncaring, who are are unable to receive God's revelation. They are not behaving based upon the truth of God. Now look at verse verse 3. Verse 13. And Adonai. And the Lord said, but it's a word that speaks about his lordship. It's not the yud heh vav heh, the typical word for the Lord, but it's a word literally written out, not enunciated, but written out, and enunciated Adonai. The Lord, he has said, because that the people, this people approach me with, we would say their mouths, but people singular, his mouth, but it's the mouth of the people. And with their tongues, literally his tongues, they, they, they honor me. So the people come forth with words and they want to honor God with the lips. So they say outwardly, but he says, but their hearts are far from me. So they may be saying things. They may be mouthing things, but their heart, the real indicator of their thoughts are far removed from from God. He says, and will come about their fear of me is not a fear. When God discerns it, it says, the commandments of men, they're taught. Now, I think that is so significant. God is saying, oh, they say nice things, but their heart is far removed from me. And the fear meaning Fear is synonymous with behavior. What fear is going to to produce action? If you're scared of something, you're going to run away. If you see something as a threat, you may fight, but there's going to be a response. 
And it says the response of the people are not based in God revelation. No, their commandment, their way of, of behaving is based upon the commandments that men have taught them, not God. And this is going to lay the foundation of what such behavior brings about and what God is going to do, a faithful God, to bring about that change that must be in order that the promises of God, the will of God, ultimately will be fulfilled. But once more, it's only going to be fulfilled for that remnant. Most of the people are going to remain indifferent, unrepentant, and not interested in God's revelation. Only that remnant is going to learn. They are going to experience this this sorrow, this, this affliction, this punishment, and it's going to move them to acknowledge their sin, to change their indifference and move towards commitment. And that remnant is going to see God renewing by means of redemption his covenantal relationship, his kingdom promises, and his will, ultimately, this remnant will know. Will you be in that remnant or not? Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank <laughs> you.